Hop là, ça là. No, not yet. There we go. All right, sweet. Um, <clears throat> So welcome to uh, another live stream. Uh, my name is Mr. McLogue, and uh, <clears throat> I want to kind of work through uh, some problems in in a quiz that I recently gave out uh, for my students. So um, I will try to you know take maybe a couple questions you know here and there um, you know a little bit before the video before we get started. Hey Riley, hey Jacob, thanks uh, for joining in. So. Um, but the main idea for at least this live stream is for me to kind of just kind of go through the quiz uh, for my students. And so therefore they have kind of something to follow up with, you know, as they're preparing for their test. So I'm just going to kind of work through um, basically what we're doing today is or what we're going to be going over is the, the basic six trigonometric graphs. So I'm going to kind of cover some problems that we've gone over for that. And then also I'm going to work on evaluating uh, trigonometric expressions and are the inverse trigonometric expressions as well as the uh, composition of inverse. Hey Alex, hey Miriam. So that is kind of my idea and if you haven't joined a uh, live stream before with me, um, one of the things that I'm kind of doing, testing out some things that I want to prepare for the upcoming years. And so I'm kind of getting used to my tablet, learning how to write on that. And then also really kind of the design and the show that I really want to uh, kind of do for, you know, this kind of thing this kind of thing uh, for next year as well and as well for the end of the year. So I'm trying out some things. Um, I'd love to kind of hear your guys' feedback, what you would like to see um, in a in a live stream, uh, you know, kind of how often and everything else. I mean, as of right now, um, I have two little girls. So, you know, really around this time frame, the 8.30, 9 o'clock, I had a little technical difficulties uh, today. So I wasn't able to get on as early as I wanted to, but then you still might be able to hear my computer running a little bit. It's, uh, I don't know, just running a little hard today. So, but, uh, anyways, I'd love some feedback and I'd also like to, uh, love to hear where you guys are from. If you guys wouldn't mind just kind of commenting, I always, uh, enjoy seeing, you know, where you guys are, uh, listening from and are watching from, I guess. And then what I'll do is I'll kind of get through the content. And if you have some questions uh, along the way, please feel just please feel free to write them in there in the chat. And then once I kind of go through this quiz, um, I will uh, try to circle back and answer as many questions as I have. But obviously I'm on the uh, Eastern Standard Time, so it is gonna be getting a little late for me and you know I gotta teach school again tomorrow. So, all right, uh, let's go ahead and scroll back up. So what we're going to, so again, for our quiz, and again, also I'm going over a quiz, so I'm not going to be going over the basics, like introductory teaching, all this stuff. I am going to kind of move along a little bit, but I will try to circle back to some of the main important parts, um, especially for, you know, if you're um, kind of new to this lesson, um, or if you've been in my class and you kind of for, totally forgot everything uh, that we've been going over for the last two weeks. So, all right, so the first first problem is y equals negative cosine of 2x minus one. And the main important thing that I really wanted to draw in with students, you know, when dealing with this is kind of like the trigonometric equation for the transformation. So if we have, you know, y equals, uh, da, 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 I could say a, and then, you know, it, it doesn't matter which trigonometric function. I'll just use cosine again, because that's kind of like my first one. I don't know, b, um, you know, I always hate like when I'm watching videos and I'm seeing people and it's taking like them forever to write because they keep on changing colors. So, but um, I think it really is important for you to see the differences here. And again, you don't need to use B and C every single time, you know, or all A, B, C, and D. You can use really any letter that you want to. But the main important thing is when we're identifying the transformations of our trigonometric functions, uh, well, I guess I must have been uh, a little delayed. Everybody's coming through here now. Um, but when we're looking at our trigonometric functions, the main important thing to identify the transformation is one, identifying A, B, C, D, A, B, C, and D, and then also just knowing what the basic parent graph is. So when my students took the quiz, you know, those are the two things I made sure that you got, you're gonna wanna know what the parent graph is. I don't really focus on graphing that much because in reality, we don't really need to know how to graph. I mean, we have graphing technology uh, with us. However, at least understanding the basic parent graph and then understand the transformations. So what I'm going to do for each of these problems is I am going to just kind of do a rough little sketch so we can kind of see, um, actually, hold on a second. Let me put, oh, I'm sorry about that. You guys can't see. I wasn't even like, I was talking. Okay, so there we go. Let me put that over there. My apologies. 
So, and I wasn't even looking at this. Yeah, so, uh, okay. So anyways, here's our quiz. And again, I was like talking to you guys. Link. So this is what we're going to be doing here. Um, working through. Oops. Zoom up. Okay. There we go. All right, so here's the quiz that we're going to go through. You can see we get the cosine, sine, tangent, cotangent, cosecant, secant. And then we get into evaluating our inverse trigonometric functions as well as composition of functions. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, today. Sorry, I forgot to switch over uh, my cameras for you on that. No, I always do that. All right, so anyways, what I was referring to is when we're looking at the trigonometric functions or at least the transformation, sorry about that, um, we want to make sure we identify what is A, B, C, and D. And basically, just like we've learned before, we understand what A, B, C, and D do to our function. And I'll go back over all that. Um, so anyways, let's get into the graphing portion and kind of just kind of see what we, what information we know and then how that's going to be kind of useful for us. So for the basic cosine graph, and again, we don't need to be Perfect. I'm just going to draw what we call the initial period. Okay, so we're going to start at like here's the x and the y axis, and we're just going to go from here. Doo, doo, doo. Okay, it doesn't need to be perfect. That's a much better though than I was doing for my homework, so that's good. Uh, 2 pi, and then obviously we see that the height is going to be 1 and negative 1. And for those of you that are just kind of getting in or have been here just for the last couple of minutes, I did um, speak about at the beginning that uh, I'll be going through some of your guys' questions here. Um, at the end, basically my idea for this uh, for this stream today is just to kind of work through this quiz so um, you can get help with trigonometric functions and identifying all this stuff, as well as for my own students, you know, they have something as a resource to go back to as far as a quiz. And then once I'm done, I'll come back and kind of look through some of your guys' questions and kind of see if there's anything else I can add, um, add some value for you guys. <clears throat> so anyways, that's like the basic parent function that we're working with uh, for the cosine function. So now what we want to do is identify basically our A, our B, and you know, let's label them. So the negative is going to be our A, the two is our B, and our negative one is our D. And again, all I'm basically doing is kind of mapping them to this basic transformation um, kind of function. All right, so identifying the period for sine and cosine is basically going to, is the half distance um, from the max and the min of the graph. And obviously you could look at this and say, well, from one to negative one, you know, that distance is two and half of that is one. But the easy way to understand that, why am I talking about amplitude? I need to be talking about period. Sorry about that, I'll slow down for a second. Um, period is the distance it takes the graph to repeat itself. And you can see that this graph, this initial period is is one period of the graph but this graph continues on and on but every two pi the graph repeats itself <clears throat> so the definition for or the way to find the new period based on the transformation is just take two pi divided by b in this case you can see our b is two so we're just going to do two pi divided by two the twos divide out to one so we're just left with pi so now basically this graph instead of it going from two pi now you know let's say there's pi now it's going to be scrunched. So that's a horizontal compression. Uh, the amplitude is the half distance from the max to the min. And basically <clears throat> you, what you're looking at that a lot of times, it, you know, it doesn't always show how high and low the graph goes, but when there's not a vertical translation, then you can kind of rely on the amplitude to determine the um, absolute max and absolute mins of the graph. And you can see in this one, you can see the, <clears throat> you know, the half, di the distance between the max and the min is two. And then the half distance of that is one. But the definition we have here is the absolute value of a, which in this case, the absolute value is going to be negative one. So therefore, absolute value of negative one is just one. Uh, the range is basically identifying the absolute max and the min of the graph. Well, you can see this graph only goes down as low as negative one and only as high as one. So therefore, my range is going to be from uh, negative one, there you go, uh, comma to one. And again, those are using brackets because it is included. Those are points on the graph. Uh, the next thing is the reflection. I'm basically just asking what type of reflection we have. We can see we're multiplying on the outside. And the best thing I remember is like, remember quadratics when we had, you know, A was negative, that was reflect the x-axis. Well, this is the same thing. I mean, it's not really the exact same. Uh, it is the same A. You're multiplying this value by your function. So therefore, it is going to reflect the x-axis. So I'm just going to write x 
axis. And actually what I will do is I'll take a quick, uh, no, I, I got to move through this because otherwise it's going to be too late. But I really do appreciate you guys uh, joining in and I'll get through, I'll get through all these questions, um, you know, kind of as quickly as I can. And then so we can kind of get to you guys uh, questions here. So in this example, I have y equals one half sine to the x over two minus, I did make a typo here, that is going to be pi over four. Okay. Um, so again, the period is where now we're going to be taking what is our B and sometimes students get confused with this X over two. Ugh. Sorry about that. With this X over two. And you just need to remember that X over two is the same thing as one half X. So therefore B in this case is one half. So therefore I'm just going to take two pi divided by one half. And then to whenever you have a number divided by a fraction, you can just multiply by the reciprocal. I do this kind of like over and over and over again because that goes to one and then two pi times two over one is just going to equal four pi. So now the graph is taking four pi to repeat itself. And let's go and take a look at what sine graph looks like. So again, the initial period of sine is, let's try to make it a little bit like the cosine graph. So the initial period of sine is going to be looking something like this. Again, just like kind of cosine, it's going to go up to one and down to negative one. And you know, here's two pi. So now what they're saying is basically this graph is going all the way to four pi. So it's like being, you know, really far stretched. It's like doo, 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 something like that. Um, but we'll kind of talk a little bit more because there's this couple of things that are going on that's affecting this graph here. Uh, the next thing is the amplitude. So what you can see is the amplitude now is the absolute value of uh, A, which in this case is the absolute value of one half, which is just going to be one half. So what that means is instead of it going up to one and down to negative one, it's now really going up to one half down to negative one half. So rather than redrawing a real graph and actually compressing this, because that's what's happening, it is a, it is a vertical compression. Um, but rather than kind of showing that, I'm just going to change my scale. Sorry, that should be a negative two, right? Good. Okay. Hey, guys. Thanks for joining. I really do appreciate it. Um, so next thing, so if, if this graph is going up to one half and down to negative one half, that means the range has changed. You can see here now the absolute maximum of this graph is negative one half and the absolute maximum is one half. So the range is going to be negative one half to positive one half. And again, those values are included. Now here's the phase shift and this is where stuff gets really, really interesting. Um, and the way that I kind of teach this is I say B stinks because you know, when we go back and look at that function, when you have a B and a C, you gotta be very careful. The phase shift, a lot of times, you know, when, when especially like in algebra two, a lot of times we just deal with the C or we just deal with the B. We don't really deal a lot of times with the B and the C. If your teacher does that, that's awesome because they're preparing you for um, these types of questions where it really tricks up a lot of students that haven't had that experience. So there is a kind of a shortcut. We could just write it, you know, some different way. But the basic thing that I like to understand is if you look at this initial period, this graph ends at, you know, this graph ends at two pi. And you could do it either other way. You could do, actually, I'm sorry, you could, you know, start with zero. You could start with any point really that's on the graph. Um, I always like to start with zero, not two pi. I always like to start with zero because um, I know that's where that point is. And to find the transformation, what I want to do is take whatever's inside the function and set it equal to zero because I'm basically setting equal to that point. And now I'm going to figure out the value of X, which is going to move this point here. So I'll kind of show you an example here, what we're going to do. Um, so I'm going to kind of do my work up here. So if I take X divided by two minus pi halves equals zero. To shorten up my work a little bit, I'm just going to add to add pi over hat pi over two to both sides. I'm not going to show that step just because it takes me a little bit longer to write with this tablet, which I'm getting used to. Um, now I have x over two equals pi halves, and then to get rid of to isolate the x, I can multiply by two on both sides. So I'll show my work there. Obviously, two divided by two goes to one. These two divided by two goes to one. So you can just see x equals pi. Now, if you're familiar with this graph, you could actually know that pi is right there. So what happens is now this graph is being shifted over here. It's being, it's going from zero to pi. So my phase shift is pi units to the right. So I'll say pi units to the right. And I should probably have some more spaces there, but 
hopefully that can be seen uh, when we go ahead and print these out. And then also remember the remember this graph is being elongated and so on and so forth. Um, all right, so let's go and get into uh, the tangent function. And the tangent function looks completely different than the sine and cosine. Uh, notice that there is no amplitude here because the amplitude is the half distance of the max and the min. And when we go ahead and graph the tangent function, what you notice is there is no max and min. We have some asymptotes, which goes back to previous chapters we've talked about. And those asymptotes are at pi halves and negative pi halves. Um, let's use a nice cool color. Let's use light green. I'll just do a nice little dashed line because asymptotes obviously are not part of the graph, but what they help us do is they help us understand that the graph is approaching those asymptotes. And the tangent graph looks something like that, okay? So there is no max or min, you can see here. And again, this is, I'm just graphing the initial period. This graph, you know, repeats itself on and on. And obviously we'll, uh, you know, I, I did this in my class and they could, so they could see it. Um, but for this quiz, I just really want to focus on, you know, the initial period and identifying the transformations. Um, I didn't do this over here, but I think it also is helpful just to make sure, you know, the one half is A, the one half here is B, and then the pi over four is C and there is no D. So that's usually something I like to do, especially when students are, you know, kind of struggling a little bit with the content. I want to make sure, I, you know, hey, let's just label, let's just label everything so we see what they are. You know, that's A. And then in this case, we can see that B is going to be two thirds because again, it's what's multiplied by X. So if it's two times X divided by three, that's really the same thing as two thirds X. So we don't have a C, which is your phase shift, and we don't have a D, which is our vertical translation. So we do gotta worry about our period though, and as well as these asymptotes, which I will um, kind of discuss here. So when we're looking at the period, um, notice that this graph from here to here is pi halves, like an absolute value distance from here to here is pi halves, and from here to here is pi halves. So if the distance that the graph takes to repeat itself, it's going to be pi halves plus pi halves, which is just pi. Excuse me. So the period for tangent and cotangent is going to be pi divided by b. Well, in this case, b is two thirds. So therefore, I'm going to do pi divided by two thirds. Now, I already did one example like this, but I'll talk about it again. When you have some number, whatever, divided by a fraction, you know, multiply by the reciprocal to get rid of the fraction because that's going to go to one. And then, what are we doing in the denominator? You have to do in the numerator. So it's going to be three times pi divided by two. So that is my new period, three pi divided by two. Cool, now this one isn't, uh, uh, what's my period? Okay, yeah, so it's three pi plus two. Is that what I wrote? Yeah, cool. Um, and then we wanna look at the domain. And so the domain is gonna be all real numbers except for where the asymptotes occur, all right? So you can see the asymptotes occur, oh, why am I right? Ah, I don't know if anybody corrected me on this, but that's obviously a positive. Sorry. Okay, uh, so obviously that's going to be a positive. So we're going from negative pi halves to pi halves. So the domain is all real numbers except for where these asymptotes occur. Well, where do these asymptotes occur? Well, I know that one asymptote, I always, I know one asymptote occurs at pi halves. And usually when you want to do this, you just want to pick one asymptote and identify where it, um, where it, where it occurs. And then again, just like what we did with the phase shift over here, you know, here I just chose a point that's on the graph and I said, you know, whatever inside the function is equal to zero. Well, now I'm gonna do the same thing for identifying where my asymptotes are. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set whatever's inside my function equal to one of my asymptotes to identify where that asymptote is getting moved. Sorry, I wanna move that up there. Okay, so what I'll do is inside my function, I have two thirds X. So I'm just gonna write, let's like purple. I like purple, it kind of brightens everything up. So do two thirds X equals, let's just pick pi halves. You could use really any, any asymptote that you want to. And then again, to isolate the variable, I'm gonna to wanna to multiply by my reciprocal. So I'll multiply by three halves, multiply by three halves. And obviously that goes to one here. The two times two is four, three times pi is three pi. So we have three pi over four. So I'm not gonna sketch this new asymptote, but what you can see is this new asymptote is obviously getting um, farther out. It's at three fourths. So we're going to say the domain is, that's supposed to be a <laughs> nice little uh, parenthesis kind of thing. So we're going to X such that X cannot equal 
and we're going to say 3 pi over 4. That's one asymptote. But we notice here, you know, this graph is it keeps on expanding. It keeps on repeating itself. So we want to see, well, what is the distance then that the between the asymptotes? Well, of the initial graph, the, as, the, the distance is pi, which ends up being the period. And what if you look at the graph, if you were to graph this function, what you'll notice is the distance between the asymptotes for tangent and cotangent is always the period. So then we've got to go back and say, well, what was our period? Well, it's 3 pi halves. So I'm going to say x cannot equal 3 pi over 4 plus 3 pi halves. And then how many times could I add 3 pi halves? Well, these graphs never stop. So we could add, you know, one time, two times, three times, four, negative one, negative two. So we're going to use a variable to represent. I mean, I don't know why I can't write that, but uh, we're going to use a variable to represent. I know it's a little, you know, confusing to stretch, but it does really help us a lot once, especially once we're getting to solving uh, trigonometric functions. The vertical stretch, um, kind of going back to our original function here, remember A is going to be your vertical stretch, just like parabolas. I mean, the main important thing, guys, remember Y equals, you know, A times X minus H squared plus K, right? A was like that vertical stretch or compression. It's the same thing here for this function. My vertical stretch is going to be a factor of four. So I'm just going to write factor of four. <laughs> I can't write four. Uh, vertical stretch factor of four. And then my range, you can see this was kind of a gimme for my students. That's going to be never ending. So it's negative infinity to infinity. All right. So let's, uh, let's work ourselves over. Still working my way up. Uh, let's go ahead and work our way up to cotangent. And the cotangent graph is going to look a little bit different um, than tangent. They're similar, but they, they're not like as connected as uh, like sine and cosine. Um, let's see here. So this one is, this graph is going to still have a period of pi. That's like the most important thing. The asymptotes now occur at pi and zero. Okay. And the graph that crosses at pi halves, FYI, graph looks like this, something like that. All right. So the period though is the exact same thing. It's pi divided by B. Um, let's go ahead and label this. So we don't, our A is one, right? If there's no A there, you can just say A is one. You can see your B is negative and, uh, well, sometimes here, let's, another way to look at this is to factor out that negative. And then we have X plus pi. And I'll show you why that is helpful. Okay, but there's no D. Um, and this will help us with identifying this phase shift as well as our reflection. And if you were to graph this, what you would know is this graph is being reflected about the y-axis. And sometimes it's not very apparent. It's being reflected about the y-axis and it's being shifted pi units to the left. And it might not be apparent because pi is not really a great transformation. But if I did like, you know, pi over 16 or something kind of crazy, you, you would be able to kind of see how that works. Um, but anyways, that's just another way to write it. But the process that I'm going to show doesn't really need for you to do that. Um, but it's just an you know, uh, interesting thing, I think, that can help some students. So anyways, period is going to be pi over b. So just do pi divided by um, negative 1. But it's not really negative 1 because if you factor that out, you, know, you can see that b is going to be 1. And, and the period, again, is the distance that it takes the graph to repeat itself. So it, you know, even if you write in the negative 1, the period is still just going to be you know, pi over b, which is just going to be pi. So I'm actually just going to leave it there. Uh, the domain, again, is occurring where uh, for all real values except where these asymptotes occur. So like what I did for uh, tangent, I am going to set whatever's inside my function equal to one of the asymptotes. So in this case, I set pi halves equal to one of the asymptotes. Um, you could set zero. That's not a problem. And I don't know why. I've always just kind of gotten the habit of setting pi equal to there. Um, so therefore, I will just, uh, actually, you know what, let's just set zero, um, because zero is an asymptote for cotangent, so it actually makes sense. So what I'll do is I'm just going to say negative x minus pi equals zero, because actually that's really easy. So therefore, I have negative x equals pi, and then divide by negative one, x equals negative pi. So now I know that there's a new asymptote at negative pi. So my domain is all real numbers x such that x cannot equal negative pi 
and then plus when is my next asymptote going to occur? It occurs every period, just like the cotangent graph. So what is the period of this new graph? Not of the parent graph. What is the period of the new graph? And that period is pi. So we can say plus pi n. And I did it a different way, but it yeah, still works. And if you obviously, if you look at this, you could probably just simplify this to pi n. It doesn't really, you don't really need that negative pi. So you could just simplify that to pi n and that'd be fine. Um, for the phase shift, we're going to do the exact same thing. Uh, basically, we want to see where is this graph shifting left or right. And now notice we did the asymptote is zero. And you could also see that um, that's, that could also be a point that we're seeing. And you could see that's being pi left. So we could say um, pi to the left, because just like I did with uh, tangent, I did the same thing. I set it equal to zero and said, all right, where is it shifting to? The range is again, another gimme problem I gave my students, negative infinity to infinity. All right, so almost done guys. I'm trying to move this as quickly as possible. Then I love to kind of just uh, get through your guys' questions and uh, talk to you just for a little bit as uh, we get to the end. Um, for a cosecant graph, the main important thing is just knowing that this is the reciprocal function of sine. So the, a lot of the things are the same. Um, obviously, the period is still going to be 2 pi. And the domain, though, is kind of like the uh, cotangent and tangent graphs because there's asymptotes here. So what I did is I'm graphing the y equals sine of x graph. And I just wanted to graph that so you guys can see how these graphs are related. So for a cosecant graph, basically what you do is you kind of have like this inverted graph and it's really cool. And we kind of looked at this on Desmos in class and kind of, you know, looked at these and looked at these characteristics. And basically the x-intercept is where the asymptotes are. Um, and then the max and the mins, it's kind of inverted. But I'm going to use this kind of diagram um, of the parent function again. It, you know, the, again, it does repeat itself every two pi. The, the interesting thing though is instead of the asymptotes occurring every two pi, you can see there's two asymptotes occur. So therefore the asymptotes occur every period divided by two. And that, that comes up in the domain. All right, um, so let's kind of get through this period here. So the period again is two pi divided by b. You can see two pi, or it is my b. So just make sure that two and pi are both your b. And that's my a. So no phase shift and no vertical translation. So again, I just have two pi divided by b, which is two pi, so that equals one. Um, do, 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 do. What else do I gotta do? Uh, so I gotta find my uh, transformation. So what I'll do is again, take my function, which is two pi x and set it equal to one of the asymptotes. The best asymptote to pick here is zero. And then I solve for x, so I divide by two pi on both sides, two pi divided by two pi. And I get x equals zero. So the domain is all real numbers x such that x cannot equal zero. And then when does the next one occur? When does the next asymptote occur? Well, it occurs um, not the period like tangent and cotangent, but half of the period, right? You can see not the period, but half of the period. So then it's going to be zero plus one half n because it can occur as many times. And you don't really need the zero there. You could delete that. But for time purposes, I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, the range is really important. This one gets students all the time. If we look at this graph, again, if when you're looking at the range from, uh, hi, DS, DSA99437, how are you? Um, when you're looking at the range they w from the graph, you're basically looking at how low does the graph go to how high does the graph go? Well, if we were to think about this, no, crap. Does that have the same sign? No, that's bad. No, this one is my sign. Okay. Um, if we were to look at this, and remember these are reciprocal functions, right? So if we were to look at this exact same graph, but instead of cosecant, I was using sine. So, you know, instead of that, I was using the sine function, one half sine of two pi x. What we would know is this graph would go up to one half and it'd go down to negative one half, right? So the range of that graph would be from negative one half to pi halves. Well, what we see here in this cosecant graph though, is it only goes as low as the maximum of the sine graph. And it only goes as high as the minimum of the sine graph. So my range is going to be from negative infinity, negative infinity, all the way up to the highest point, which is negative one half, which is the lowest of the sine graph. And then, oops, sorry, that is included. 
and then union jumps up here. There's nothing going on in the orange graph here, and then jumps up to one half comma infinity. Okay, um, so secant is very similar to that. Uh, when dealing with the secant function, that's going to be the reciprocal of cosine. So let's kind of graph cosine again one more time. Like that, 2 pi. Um, let's use pink or purple or violet or I don't know what that is. Um, again, there's going to be asymptotes here occurring at where it x intercepts. And all these maxes and mins are going there. Okay, um, and so now when we're basically looking at this graph, it look, kind of looks a little different, but the period is still going to be 2 pi over b. Um, in this case, our b is 1. You can see there's a coefficient here. We do have a c and a d. So now we have a phase shift and a vertical translation. Um, so the period is just going to be 2 pi divided by 1, which is just 2 pi. The domain is going to be all real numbers except for where the asymptotes occur. Now, this one sometimes gets a lot, gets some students. Here's 2 pi, here's pi, this point is pi halves. So if you look at where the graph crosses on the uh, cosine graph, it actually crosses at pi halves. So when I want to find where this new asymptote is, what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to take what's inside my function and then equal it to pi halves. So now i got to subtract pi over 4. That's a subtract sign. Subtract pi over 4, and I get x equals, well, what's 1 half minus 1 fourth um, is going to be pi over 4. So my domain is all real numbers such that x cannot equal pi over 4. That's the, where the new asymptote occurs. And then again, just like the, oh, sorry, I knew that was going to happen. Got to push that up. It's pi over 4. Again, just like the uh, tangent graph, the asymptotes occur every half of the period. So my period here is 2 pi, so therefore I'm going to add pi n. Okay, boom. The range, um, you can see here the range, if we look at this as a secant graph, let's just, or a cosine graph, it's 1, then that mean that goes down to negative 1 and goes up to 1, but now the graph is being shifted down 2. So now the graph is going to go down to negative 3, I'm sorry, it's going to go from negative infinity to the highest it's going to go, right? Because that's the maximum. But if that's being shifted down to the highest it's going to go is from negative three. And then union, this being shifted down to is going to take us to negative one infinity. Um, did I not talk about the horizontal compression? I did. I forgot. Uh, the phase shift, again, you could just set this equal to zero and solve. So I could say, you know, x plus pi over 4 equals 0, subtract that over, so x equals pi over 4 to the left. So I'll say pi over 4 to the left. i got to work on my penmanship, which I will do. Um, real quick, though, I wanted to kind of cover this horizontal compression. Uh, remember, when we were looking back up top, we talked about A represented the vertical stretch and compression. Well, guess what? B represents your horizontal stretch and compression. And... If you look at the graphs, what you will see is when B is going to be large, it's kind of like a vertical bread, but it's a horizontal compression. So our horizontal compression here is 2 pi, okay? Don't think of it, a lot of people think of the 1 half because they think of it as a vertical compression, but it's really 2 pi is your um, compression there. All right, so we're about to wrap it up here, guys, and then I would love to kind of... Uh, you know, check in with you guys. Um, if you have not already mentioned, uh, please let me know where you guys are from. I'd love to kind of hear from you. And, you know, once I, I'll be getting done with this here in the next five minutes. So I'd love to uh, kind of look through your chat and, you know, kind of see if there's any questions I can kind of answer and as well as kind of see where you guys are from. So uh, we're coming into the home stretch here. Now to do the home stretch here, we got to know the unit circle. And I hate graphing the unit <laughs> or drawing up the unit circle every single time that I have to go through this. But it's really kind of hard to like teach without having something to uh, go off of. So uh, I guess I can just bite the bullet. All right. For these next problems, you got to know. Uh, ooh. You got to know your points on the unit circle, okay? At least in the first quadrant. Um, so our first point, you know, square root of three over two, comma. Actually, you know what? 
let's uh, I'm gonna put this off in down below on the next page just so I can look at this because there is some teaching that I'm gonna want to do um, from this so let's do a nice big one that doesn't oh, it looks horrible but that's okay all right so let's get through these points that's not okay well I'm struggling here a little bit but uh, we're almost done so this first angle point is right there square root of 2 over 2 square root of 2 over 2 so that all right that is a 2 there we go and then this point is going to be uh, 1 half comma square root of 3 over 2 all right this point is 0 comma 1 and this point is 1 comma 0 and what I tell my students is you don't need to memorize this you should be you should have, have done enough problems here where you know this first quadrant of the unit circle and if you don't know the first unit of the quadrant circle you haven't done enough practice problems in my class because this is something that uh, will slow you down when you're taking tests or quizzes and you don't want to get to that point where we have a multi-step problem and what's taking you the longest time is having to redraw the unit circle okay so when we're doing trigonometry you know sine cosine tangent we're basically looking at you know the relationships of sides of a triangle right and again remember the unit circle is just our way of taking you know a triangle <laughs> and with the hypotenuse of one and comparing the you know adjacent uh, the opposite and adjacent side and then writing those as coordinate points uh, on the unit circle but anyways if we want to find the angle we're going to use inverse trigonometry so when we're looking at these problems um, when we're looking at these problems, arc sine of square root of 3 over 2 is basically asking me the sine of what angle equals the square root of 3 over 2. Now we know sine is opposite over hypotenuse, but if we look at that as far as on the unit circle, since the, since the hypotenuse, let's go back down here, since the hypotenuse is 1, then we can just say it's the opposite side, which is the height of that point, which is also the y coordinate. So basically, this question is asking you what angle gives us a y coordinate of square root of 3? Well, no, that y coordinate is 1. This y coordinate is square root of 3 over 3. Good job. It's pi over 3. Good. And then we have to make sure we restrict in the domain, which I talked about, which I don't really have time to go through on this. Um, but I will kind of mention it at least again. So therefore, theta or I don't need to write theta and his, we can say that this angle is pi over 3. Now, in looking into the secant function, remember secant is the reciprocal of uh, cosine. And a lot of times, you can see that there's no negative 2 here, right? So what we'd want to do, though, is use the cosine instead of the sine. So what I'd like to do is i like to rewrite this as C not. What i like to do is write this as secant of what angle instead of using negative 2 let's use the what am I doing I want to write that as cosine sorry so I want to write this as cosine of what angle equals negative one half okay so I don't want to I don't want to use negative 2 I basically want to take the reciprocal of that which is going to be 1 over negative 2 and I can use the reciprocal of that and then reciprocal of secant is cosine you could also just rewrite this as you know 1 over cosine of theta equals negative 2 and then solve it that way which I did show in class and made some videos on but it usually just takes a little bit longer um, anyways this is much easier we have this cosine equals negative 1 half so when is it equal to negative 1 half well when you guys look at this we have an issue because we have 1 half cosine equals 1 half but it's not negative so we have to make sure we know the restrictions of our cosine graph and cosine the d domain restrictions for cosine is the first and the second geez oh man come on is the first and second quadrant so therefore i need to find an angle that is in the first and second that's either in the first or in the second quadrant well here is not going to work however However, if I took this point and reflected it over here, that new point would be negative one half comma square root of three over two. You could also, and then that point, if you look at the reference angle here, it's gonna be the same reference angle. So here, from here to here is pi over three, 
And then from there to there is pi over three. And that's kind of helpful when understanding what that angle is. Because again, our answer is we're trying to find this angle from here to there. Well, you could also say, oh, well, what about this one down here, which is like a reflection of both of those, right? Well, that's in the third quadrant and that doesn't fall within the domain restriction. So it has to be in the first or the second. That's our angle. If we know halfway around a circle is three pi over three and we're pi over three short, we can see our angle here is going to be two pi over three. And that ended up being our answer. So we'll just write here is going to be two pi over three. And again, doesn't matter if you're dealing with the secant or the reciprocal function, just go ahead and use uh, the reciprocal. For arc cosine of theta, um, basically we're saying what angle gives us cosine of zero. So we look at our unit circle and we say, all right, when is the x coordinate zero? Well, you can see the x coordinate zero here. What is that angle? That angle is pi halves. And it can be, and again, does that fall within our domain restriction for cosine in the first and second quadrant? Yeah, I mean, it's on the y axis, then, but it falls within there. So therefore, that's going to be pi halves. Oh, I've got to write the answer up there. And last but not least, arc sine. When is sine of what angle? Oh, shoot, I got two more. Sine of what angle equals negative square root of two over two. So sine and tangent, my last two examples, are different than cosine, or at least as far as their domain restrictions. So I need, so we know that, you know, we're looking for when is the y coordinate equal to square root of two over two? Well, again, here's your y coordinate, square root of two over two. Good, what's that angle? That angle is pi over four, but we need the negative version. So basically what we need is we need the angles that are down here, and, geez, all right, and down here, and then down here, right? Now, again, all of these are going to have the same reference angles of pi over 4 and pi over 4, okay? Um, so the domain restrictions for sine and tangent are the first and the fourth quadrant. So that means your angle needs to lie in the first and the fourth quadrant. So therefore, this one, even though this point is a reflection, it's negative square root of two over two, comma negative square root of two over two, we can't draw from standard form out to here without getting outside of the first and second quadrant. So this one doesn't work. And actually even going from here to here is not gonna work as well because that goes outside of the first and the fourth quadrant to get around. So what we need to do is we need to stay contained between, another way of looking at this, staying contained between pi halves and negative pi halves. So if we know the distance between this angle, this reflection here again is, you know, square root of two over two comma negative square root of two over two. Again, because it's in the fourth quadrant, y is negative. So if we just go from standard form down to here, we can just go in the negative direction and then that will give us our answer. And again, all of these you guys can verify with the calculator, but this answer is going to be negative pi over four. And then tangent stinks. I just hate doing tangents because when you look at the unit circle, what is this? Square root of three over three? Okay. When you look at the unit circle, you're thinking, oh, you know, sine, you know, what angle gives you sine? You just find the y's and you like find them. Um, when you're looking for cosine, you're just looking for the x's and say, which one, you know, gives us that here. And when you're looking for the reciprocal functions, you just flip it, make it flip it, and then use, you know, your trigger function. But when you're looking for tangent, tangent's y over x. So that means I got to work out or I got to do enough examples that I kind of have them memorized. So I got to take my Y coordinate over my X coordinate and simplify it. Now I've done this so many times for my class. I'm not going to keep on doing all this algebra here. Um, but what this one relates down to is square root of three. That's not what I was looking for. These are the same Y and X. So therefore those are going to simplify to one. And then this one, if I do one half divided by square root of three over two, that simplifies to one over the square root of three, rationalize the denominator, square root of three over three. Again, this is the quiz. I'm not gonna work through that again. Um, my students know where to go to get help if they need that. So anyways, what was that angle? That angle is pi over six. So that is going to be my angle I was looking for. All right, we are almost done. Man, I've been here for like 45 minutes. Okay, um, so on this one, now what we're doing is we're doing a, um, now what we're doing is we're, do, 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 now what we're doing, we're doing a composition function. So when you're doing these types of problems, what you want to do is work on the inside most function first. So cosine of five power six. So now we're evaluating, we're not doing the inverse trigonometry, we're just evaluating. So I go to, you know, if here's pi over six, five pi over six is going to be pi, basically this angle or this point reflected over here. Right, so therefore the that's going to be negative square root of three over two comma positive one half. 
And again, it has the same ref uh, reference, <laughs> the curved angle. It has the same reference angle. Here's pi over six, here's pi over six. Halfway around circle is six pi over six. Subtract one, that's five pi over six. So there's your angle. We're looking for the cosine, which is negative square root of three over two. So therefore, I'm looking for arc cosine or cosine inverse of, uh, what was my angle? Square root of three over two? Negative square root of three over two. And then if I want to find what angle gives me negative square root of three over two, well, again, it's going to be this angle five pi over six, because the only other angle that gives me negative square root of three over two is going to be down here in the uh, third quadrant. And that doesn't fall within our domain restrictions. So guess what? This answer is actually just written in the problem. Kind of cool. Doesn't always work that way though, but it is kind of cool. Um, this was my, one of my most missed questions on my quiz. Um, so we have sine of pi half. So we just got to evaluate the sine of pi half. So we find the angle pi halves. The sine is the y coordinate. And so that equals one. So now what we're asking ourselves is arc tan or tan inverse of uh, one. So when does tangent equal one? Well, tangent equals one when y over x is equal to one. Well, y over x is equal to one at pi over four. And then last but not least here, we have arc sine and cosecant. We know that those are reciprocals of each other. Um, here we're trying to find what angle gives us sine, uh, sine of what angle is going to equal to one half. So I'll kind of go back to my inner circle and say, when is the y coordinate equal to one half? Okay, that is going to be that angle right here, which is pi over six. And therefore I have cosecant of pi over six. Now again, cosecant of pi over six is really the same thing as one over sine of pi over six. Well again, sine of pi over six is what we just kind of figured out. The sine of pi over six is one half. So really, this answer is one over one over two. And then you could just simply multiply by the reciprocal again. And therefore you get two. And ladies and gentlemen, we are done. Congratulations for staying along. Uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of uh, check in and see what you guys have. So if you guys do have any kind of questions, uh, I am done with my quiz. I really do appreciate uh, you guys staying on and you know, kind of seeing, uh, you know, getting some help with your math. <sighs> so I usually wanted to kind of do some breaks here a little bit more um, through this, but it's just kind of tough because, you know, what I'm trying to see is I want to make these uh, videos. Oh, and if you're actually still with me, because I was like, oh, man, I'm going to go through my chat. If you're still with me, uh, please make sure you guys comment. I want to give you guys some uh, shout outs here as I'm kind of done. And then uh, also, I don't see uh, anybody where they're, uh, where they're from. Ann Arbor, Michigan. Oh, Abigail, I miss you. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I hope you're still on, Abigail. Georgia, Canada. Very good. Dallas, okay. California. Oh, thank you. This is awesome. Very good. Very good. Oh, Abigail. So anyways, um, I just, I guess I'll just talk to, uh, some platinum Dylan, Jason kid. Yeah. I know I get that a lot. And, uh, um, uh, Aaron innocent. Can I ask a separate problem? Sure. Aaron. I mean, uh, I, what's say is it 10 Oh seven. I mean, I'm happy to kind of go through another like eight more minutes. I can maybe ask some questions. I'm not sure how much time I have. I do want to do some kind of Q and A and that's what I, you know, would like to kind of get your guys feedback of, Hey, troublesome coin, um, is, you know, how, how do you guys think the, the random kind of Q and A would work? Um, you know, I was looking at a couple of things as far as maybe doing some Facebook groups and having people, you know, send problems. Um, obviously we could use the, you know, this, uh, the group chat, but you know, then it's kind of hard to really kind of send your problems. And also I want to have time to kind of look over the problems just to make sure that I'm kind of prepared going over some of the questions, you know, maybe kind of picking like three or four or five different questions. But you know, so a couple of things I'm looking at, obviously I'm always going to be streaming on YouTube, but I was looking at to maybe integrating like some Facebook lives and then just having the separate stream over here on YouTube. Um, you know, but then also just kind of transferring because obviously right now I teach pre-calculus and calculus. And I know there's students that are watching my videos when I taught algebra one. And I know there's video people that are watching my uh, videos when I taught geometry and algebra two and, you know, so on and so forth. So those are, uh, those are kind of things that I'm kind of working on that I'd like to, you know, really try to by till the end of the year, kind of get some kind of feedback 
And I know this kind of live stream was, you know, kind of took a little, you know, it took a long, I mean, it was like 40 minutes. So unless you were like really into this, I mean, not many people are going to be staying around just watching some random quiz that maybe they already know what they're doing or they haven't learned this yet or it's not part of their class. So, um, you know, those are some of the things that like kind of making these a little bit shorter and therefore then I can kind of interact with you guys. Hey, Trevor from Texas. Awesome. So Aaron, you have 18 sine of X equals nine square root of two. Okay, well, I can actually do that one. I know that answer kind of off the top of my head. So I'll be more than happy to help you out here, Aaron. Hey, Trevor, hey, Diamond. Thank you very much, Diamond. I really do appreciate it. I am, you know, just a normal teacher doing the same thing for the last 11 years. And now that technology has really just allowed me to, uh, you know, teach more people. And I think that's like the awesome thing about technology is, you know, I can get on a live stream and I don't think any of my students are on my live stream, but you know, they, they know, Hey, if they want some afternoon, if they want some like evening help, um, I'm here, I'm available. I have, you know, that around students date after my classroom, but all of you guys obviously can't stay after school with me. So this is just kind of my way to, um, allow you guys to kind of come into my classroom peer per se, I guess in my, uh, in my dining room and, you know, just kind of ask some questions. So Aaron, I'll kind of help you out here. Uh, do, do, do. let's do some black. So the main important thing when you're solving, because this is really related to this, so that's why I really want to kind of go over this. Um, all you got to do when you're solving for trigonometric functions, you're going to want to do the same thing that we just kind of did. You want to isolate your trigonometric function. So to do that, I'll divide by 18 on both sides. And therefore, I get sine of x equals 9 over 18 is 1 half. So that's square root of 2 over 2. And again, this is exactly what we just did. You know, sine of what angle equals square root of two over two. Or you could say, you know, x equals sine inverse of square root of two over two. I don't think that was one of my problems though, was it? Yeah, it was, it was negative though. Um, so anyways, we're looking for what coordinate gives you y square root of two over two, and that angle is pi over four. So x is gonna equal pi over four. Now for solving trigonometric function, it is a little bit different than kind of what we did. When you're solving, we're looking for either all the solutions between zero and two pi or all possible solutions. So in this case, I do want to find the other solution um, that gives me square root of two over two. Well, that value is going to be the also in the second quadrant because that value is um, where y is positive. So we need to figure out, well, if I'm doing a reflection angle, let's say, you know, here's pi over four. So here's pi over four. That means that's pi over four. So if halfway around circles four pi over four, then um, if halfway around circles four pi over four, then subtracting pi over four would give me three pi over four. So between zero and two pi, if that was your restriction, it'd be five over four comma three pi over four. Um, and then to find the all the solutions, you would actually add two pi n to both of those answers, and that would give you uh, your other solutions. So all right, I don't know. I guess that. Uh, Awesome Light says, you are awesome. You have helped me with a lot of my math problems. I'm from Laredo, Tetis. Well, Awesome Lights, I'm very happy to be able to help you out. Um, thank you. I, awesome, I need some more helps with geometry. Well, I haven't taught geometry, but I, you know, what I'm thinking of doing is like creating like some live stream classes. We're basically like, I don't know, you guys can tell me like yes or no if you think this might be a good idea. But basically like I could dedicate a night of like, you know, Monday talking about pre-calculus or Tuesday um, algebra two and, you know, Wednesday geometry and, you know, something like that, something kind of dedicated, um, you know, where at least you guys know that I'm going to be offering a live stream and basically kind of have something where you guys sub could submit questions. So if you think that's a good idea or if maybe you have some different ideas, um, feel free to just add them in the chat or if you want to, you know, private message me at this, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the stream, I'm kind of looking for some feedback. I'm doing some things to, you know, practice drawing circles, um, you know, cause I want to get really good at using this tablet. I want to get good with my equipment that I am using and that I've purchased for this. So, uh, you know, I'm just kind of be testing, you know, testing the waters here for the next couple, uh, next couple months. And then I really want to get something good and ready for next year. Um, Bacon and cash. Why are you a better teacher? My cops, especially you're awesome. Well, you know, I, 
I, uh, I am just one that struggled with math and have been teaching for 11 years and some things in math never made sense to me when I was going through it where a lot of you guys are and teaching has allowed me to kind of better understand things and then uh, and also kind of look at it, remind myself and to like kind of relearn them again and being like, oh, well, now it kind of makes sense and I can teach this a little bit. And obviously not everything that I've you know taught or made a video on is a great explanation. I mean, I even look back at some of my videos and I'm like, wow, that was a horrible explanation or I, that's wrong. <laughs> I should have said that, uh, even though I might have been doing the math wrong, I might say something wrong, you know, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a growing thing. And that's what I want to do is just keep on getting better, better as a teacher. And then obviously, you know, reaching, reaching more and more students. Uh, it's Goon JXR. Can you help me with the question, please, sir? I'll give it my best. It is 10 14. I did want to finish this by 10 15. Um, but let me actually, oh, let me go back to your question. How would you find the value of sine theta if the measure of theta is negative three square root of two? Okay, so it's basically the same thing. Sine of x equals negative square root three over two. So again, we go back up to our unit circle. Sine represents y coordinates is positive square root of three over two, which is the angle is pi thirds, but we need negative. So negative means it has to be down in the third and the fourth quadrant. But what we've talked about today is it can't be negative or it can't be outside of the first and the fourth quadrant. That's the domain restriction of sine and tangent. And I don't have time to go over and explain that because this is a quiz review and it's kind of run out of time for me. But as long as you know that your angle has to remain in the first and the fourth quadrant or your angle measure has to be between negative pi halves and pi halves, I can't do pi over three. But what I can do is do negative pi over three, which will take me to this, which will take me to a reflection of this point in the fourth quadrant, which that coordinate point would be, you know, one half comma negative square root of three over two. So the answer to your question is x equals negative pi over three. All right, what do I teach? This year, uh, Andrew, I am teaching pre-calculus and calculus AB. So, but I've taught everything from algebra one, geometry, algebra two, you know, honors, uh, math for college readiness, all, you know, kind of remedial math. Um, and, but I, I have taught the most pre-calculus and then this is my second year teaching uh, second year teaching calculus. So um, Diamond says, I'd like some help on pre-algebra and algebra. I would love to get back into some algebra questions and get into that. Hey, Aaron, Florida, up in Jacksonville. Um, I really love to get into some of those, you know, earlier kind of questions and really kind of build up basically like a high school and college experience from the ground up all the way, you know, to some higher, higher level uh, mathematics. Uh, Skillful Blitz, is it more important for a math teacher to teach how to solve everything using algebra or the calculator? I have a lot of video ideas that I'm going to be coming up with this. And, you know, basically what, you know, we got to be careful as math teachers what we're making our students do because so much of what we can do is can be used on a computer, can be done with our cell phone. And while there's obviously some very important skills that we want people to be able to do, like for instance, the unit circle. I mean, you know, I always joke with my students, like you're never going to need to know the unit circle um, when you go to the grocery store. You're never going to know it in, you're never going to need to know it in real life. You're, it, there's no point in you knowing the unit circle. However, um, it, you know, having these points or at least the first quadrant is going to significantly reduce the amount of time that you're spending on some more, you know, complicated problems that you are going to encounter in this curriculum. And obviously, pre-calculus and calculus is an upper level curriculum. It's not a curriculum that's designed for everybody. It's people, it's designed for people that are going into a field that's going to be somewhat related with mathematics. So, um, you know, this knowing that unit circle is going to be very beneficial, or at least the first quadrant is going to be very beneficial. However, I feel like graphing lines, you know, like notice on my quiz, my students didn't have to graph. I used to make my students graph all the time. They used to have to know how to graph and shift it. And it's just a waste of time. Like you don't need to know how to graph something. I mean, you need to know the parent function. You need to know how these transformations, um, you know, for certain topics, but you really don't need to know how to graph. I think it's, I think that's one thing that we waste so much time on. Just use a calculator or your phone. It's much faster. Uh, hey, awesome lights. You get a shout out, man. Absolutely, man. I really do appreciate you guys uh, staying, staying in time with me. Hey, Zach. Uh, hey, Trevor. How do you find the table of values when solving quadratic equations? Zach, uh, 
I will definitely be getting to some of those. I don't have time. I wanted to get down at 10.15. It is now 10.18. So guys, I am going to have to sign off, but I really do appreciate it. FYI, just so you guys know, uh, I do plan on going live on Mondays and Tuesday nights at this point in time. So if you do want to kind of get the notification, I wanted to try to go live today at 8.30. I didn't get out live until 9.15. Um, but if you want to kind of get the notification of when, when I'm going to be getting li going live next, uh, make sure you guys uh, hit that bell subscribe or subscribe and get the bell notification. And then you kind of know, um, but you guys can kind of get a routine until I get this thing down. I plan on going live at least every week, and I prefer to do it on Monday and Tuesday nights. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for uh, showing up for uh, today's live stream, and I will see you guys next time.